the council meetings are at a conference right now, but they will be watching um, either tonight or via recording. PCTV is here recording this meeting. We'll make this uh, video feed available to uh, the public on our website in the near future. And all the feedback from this meeting will be provided to the city council in different forms. At this point, I'd really like to uh, welcome um, our facilitator, I'll let her do, introduce herself, but she is with the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center. She's gonna make sure that this, it's, <laughs> that's a deceiving name. They are experts. <laughs> they are experts in running these kinds of meetings, facilitating public input. They're a great resource that we have here in San Mateo County. And uh, they've helped us to plan this meeting and to make it as effective as possible. And with that, I'll turn it over and uh, we'll move forward. Yeah, the name is deceiving. We're not here because we are expecting conflict. I'm actually excited because um, when I first heard about this meeting, um, I was told that we were going to be talking about weed. So um, I was looking forward to being here to see what, um, what we were going to be um, engaging and how, um, and how the community was going to um, turn out. So um, my name is Thomasina Russell, as uh, Matthew mentioned. I'm from the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center. The center is an expert in communication and conflict resolution. We help reduce violence, we help engage youth, and we strengthen families. We have facilitators on the floor tonight, and I'm not accustomed to working like this. Can I stand up? Is that okay? All right, thank you. Okay, can I carry this? Is that all right? Okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm used to having a, um, a floor mic, being able to walk around and to be a part of the group. Um, we do have an agenda that is planned for you today, and we have group agreements. We have facilitators that will be on the floor with you, and um, the role of the facilitator is just to help guide the process. Um, my role as a lead facilitator tonight is to help guide you throughout the entire meeting. So I'm going to ask if Anne, um, who will be our scriber for tonight, if she could, um, or she waved at you already, but also if she could come forward, if that's okay. Thank you. The other facilitators that are staffed by um, the city, are you present tonight? Could you stand and could you wave at the people so that they'll know who you are? All right. Okay, so other facilitators will be joining us. We are excited about the people that are here tonight. So thank you so much for taking out time of your busy schedule and coming out and being a part of the conversation. So our agenda tonight, we have presentations that will take forth by the city. We have a time set for questions and answers, and during that time, you'll be able to follow up with clarifying questions. So only clarifying questions to the presentation at that time, okay? There, if you have other questions, and other questions will come up, please feel free to jot them down on the index card that is set before you. Those index cards, those questions, does every, do we have the index cards on the table already? Negative, okay, not yet. Okay, not yet, okay. But they will be present, we'll make sure that you have them. So those index cards are just as important. All questions are important. And what will happen is that those questions will be answered and then distributed to you at a later time. And um, Matthew will talk more about that. Next, we'll break out into small groups and we're gonna have to resituate you just a little bit because we did plan um, for a smaller group. So in order for us to accommodate everyone that's in the room and we want everyone to be heard, we're gonna um, create just little sections, maybe two tables at a time where facilitators can, um, can handle the groups. Is that okay? Okay. After the small groups, we'll talk about next steps. And so that will look like what's gonna happen next, what's gonna happen to the information that's being gathered, where would that information be distributed, where will it be posted? And Matthew will talk more about that. After that, then we'll close out. And then during the close, closing, we were, we were gonna make men mention to you because the meeting was set to end at eight o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. It's supposed to have been an hour and a half, but because we knew that there would be a lot of people coming out, not sure of the amount, wasn't expecting this, 
However, we want to make sure that we hear from everyone. So more time has been allotted to this particular session, just to 8.30. So we hope that that's okay. 8.30 will be the closing time. During that time, you can do what is called round robin review. And you will go around and you can review what everyone has written. You know, you can see the comments, what's similar, what, what may be different from yours. And so that's how that session is going to to go. Oh, we're asking also that um, before you leave, we'll have evaluations out. Uh, we're asking that you um, fill out the evaluation. The evaluation uh, will be pertaining to um, the facilitation of this meeting. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so before we move forward into our um, program, just want to lay out some group agreements for our group here is so many of us we do group agreements because it allows the meeting to flow very easily it allows for everyone to be heard and then it creates a safe space for everyone that's in the building we ask that when you speak that you speak respectfully that you be open-minded because there's so many different people in the room with different ideals and suggestions be open-minded we ask that one person speak at a time. So because there is a lot of people here, we want to make sure that everyone is being heard and that all ideals and suggestions are being captured. So please, if you can, one person speak at a time. We ask also that you step up, step back. That has a lot to do with air time. Some people are chatty, 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 chatty. Then we have other people who are not so chatty. But we want you to be conscious of your air time. And we don't have a lot of time, so please, step up, step back. Be respectful around that. Ask questions. Don't assume. We want you to be curious, and we invite curiosity. Don't assume. Please, ask questions. Next, we ask that all technology will be placed on vibrate, if that's okay. Everybody has cool cell phone tones, so we want to ask that you place those cell phone tones on silent tonight. Another thing that we ask is that you allow the facilitators to facilitate the process. Some people have big personalities. I have a big personality, and I tend to chime in a lot of times and try to give instructions, but we want to allow the facilitators to facilitate the process. Lastly, with everything that's been said, enjoy your time here. Have fun. You're amongst community, um, you're amongst community members, residents, neighbors. Have fun while you're here. Is that OK? All right, thank you so much. Okay, so next, oh, we're gonna do community introductions. All right, we're gonna see who's in the room. So I'm gonna do what is called a stand if. So I'm gonna ask a question. And if that question applies to you, we're gonna ask that you stand, okay? All right, so the first question is, do you live, who lives, I should say, in Half Moon Bay? How many of you live in Half Moon Bay? Oh wow, quite a few, whoa. That's a lot of you. All right, thank you. Okay. Stand if you have children or grandchildren who go to school in Half Moon Bay. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an additional one to that. Remain standing. Stand if you went to school in Half Moon Bay. There you go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Stand if you work in Half Moon Bay. Okay, you remain standing. Stand if you play in Half Moon Bay. There you go. Stand if you worship in Half Moon Bay. Am I getting everyone? All right, just about, just about. That was a good crew. Stand if you own a business in Half Moon Bay. All right, so I think we captured just about everyone in the room. Thank you all so much for coming out and participating. Thank you so much. So next, 
I think we're ready now for our presentations. Okay, so the city is going to present to us at this time. They have three topics that they're going to review with you. State and local cannabis laws will be one. The next topic will be background on how city got to where it is with regards to discussing cannabis. And lastly, information on current draft ordinance and what it currently contains. Okay, now you're in the hands of Matthew and Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Minner, Deputy City Attorney. I've been working with the city on the cannabis ordinance and working with staff and council members. I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of how we got here and how the state law process has been developing and how the state licensing of commercial cannabis businesses interacts with local licensing and laws. Um, so medical marijuana has been decriminalized in California for a long time and there have been jurisdictions that have been allowing uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, these operate as not-for-profit collectives. But in 2015, the state passed legislation to uh, switch to um, allowing commercial can medical marijuana businesses. This would be for-profit, run by people who are not just qualified patients, but really bringing what had been kind of an underground industry into being licensed and regulated by the state. Um, while the state was developing that licensing process, the voters in 2016 approved Prop 64, which legalized adult use cannabis, and cannabis is now the term used throughout all these state regulations. Um, and in this summer, the state legislature passed uh, additional law, SB 94, that basically marries these two regulatory processes for medical cannabis and adult use cannabis. So you'll have one um, licensing and regulatory scheme for two different types of cannabis. Uh, the, the state is looking at uh, four, five different types of licenses that they will uh, give to different types of commercial cannabis businesses. So the first is, is cultivators, and there are different types of licenses depending on the type of cultivation and how large the uh, cultivation site is. So there's indoor, outdoor, mixed light. Uh, the mixed light is the cultivation that would occur within greenhouses. And then there's different licenses for how, how large the cultivation site is. There's also required third-party testing for quality control. Uh, and so a testing lab will be another type of business that's licensed by the state. Uh, another business is a distributor. This is not to be confused with a dispensary. The distributor is the business that picks up the cannabis from the cultivation site and then takes it to the testing lab uh, to be tested, takes it to the manufacturer who does the extraction and the production of cannabis products uh, such as edibles and tinctures, and then the dis distributor would also take it to either the cannabis flowers or the cannabis products to the retail store. And so the two other types of licenses that you have is one for the manufacturer. Again, this is the extracting the cannabis um, and making products out of it, and then a license for the retail. And the retail license can include both a storefront and a delivery business, either both or uh, you know, one or the other. And so now that the state is looking at licensing these types of commercial cannabis activities, local governments throughout California are faced with needing to decide whether they're going to prohibit these activities in their jurisdictions or whether they will adopt an additional licensing and regulatory process for how, you know, which type of these um, activities that they're gonna allow in their jurisdiction, where they're gonna allow them, and whether they're gonna adopt any additional regulations over and above what the state is doing. And, and the state's doing a lot right now. Uh, the, the state law has statutory requirements. I've listed some of them here. They're mainly aimed at um, safety and security measures to make sure that uh, cannabis is not diverted illegally to other states or to minors within our state. Um, they're trying to address environmental concerns uh, and 
there's a number, so there's a number of regulations in the state statute itself. Uh, and then this, uh, there's a, several state agencies now who are adding meat to the bones there and developing additional regulations um, to license and regulate those commercial cannabis uh, businesses. And so I've listed the different agencies here who are currently in the process of developing additional regulations, again, around safety and security, environmental concerns. I mean, this is everything from putting childproof packaging and limiting where you can advertise and making sure advertisement's not attractive to minors and you know, how you're gonna run your cultivation business. So those regulations are all being developed by the state now. And they are planning to release those regulations in November of this year. There were regulations that were released earlier for, for the medical marijuana businesses, when it used to be just medical marijuana. The state's rescinding those. We expect the new regulations will look very similar, but there have been changes in the law, so they will be a little bit different based on the new, the new legislation that's passed this summer. So, the, my last slide is just to briefly go over the process of how the state licensing um, interacts with, with the local licensing. Uh, so the state is planning to be up and running with its licensing process, uh, program in January of 2018, uh, when, once they've finalized their regulations, and they will begin accepting and processing applications at that time. Now, uh, it used to be that in order to apply for a state license, you had to have your local license in place. If the local governments decided they're going to, uh, to permit or license this activity, um, that is no longer required, that now um, businesses can submit an application for a state license, and the state will collect information from local governments about what types of activity are prohibited in their jurisdiction, if the activity is prohibited, they'll just reject the license outright. If it hasn't been expressly prohibited, the state will contact this, the city or county and ask them, does this business comply with all of your local rules and regulations? And the local governments have the ability to set the rules and regulations that they want to over and above what the state does and to require additional local permits and licenses. And so the city would have 60 days to say whether this business meets with all their requirements or not. Um, and then the state will continue to process the application to make sure it complies with state laws. Uh, the, there is also a process in, in 2018 that if a commercial cannabis business is already, um, already has their state or their local license, um, they can apply for a temporary state license anytime in 2018. And this will be, uh, they'll say, you know, you come in and say, okay, I've been operating in this local jurisdiction. I've received a local permit to operate. And the state will say, okay, you can continue to operate. Here's a license that's gonna last for 120 days, but you're gonna have to submit a regular application for the state license and we will go through and make sure you comply with all our new regulations, but, but you can operate in the meantime. So uh, the, the one change here to be clear about is we've been, our consultants have been in contact with the State Bureau of Cannabis Control, and under this new law, there's no longer going to be a January 2nd, 2018 deadline for submitting those um, applications for temporary license. Uh, under the medical marijuana law, they wanted, there was a deadline for businesses that were already up and running, and it put a lot of pressure on people to get things done quickly. That's no longer the case we're hearing. The, the state understands that it's taking local governments a while to get their own licensing processes in place. They want it to be a um, flexible process for businesses, and so they're allowing businesses to submit applications for temporary uh, state license anytime they get their local license, and that can occur after January 2nd of 2018. Oh yes, and uh, so, and and uh, and and right now uh, we don't have any lawful commercial cannabis businesses in Half Moon Bay because there is the Half Moon Bay has an existing ban on on uh, on marijuana uh, cult, cult production and uh, 
and um, collectives that was put on the books a long time ago. So right now, everything's prohibited in, in Half Moon Bay under that current law. But nonetheless, this, the, because of the changes in the state law, the city is needing to revisit that, to update that, to comply with what's currently happening in state law and make sure that we're covering all the businesses that the state might otherwise license if it's not clearly addressed in Half Moon Bay's law. So I'd like to take just a, a few minutes to talk about what the city has done to date regarding um, public meetings and public input and then talk about you know the direction we've received from city council. So the city council actually convened its first meeting on commercial cannabis licensing um, immediately following the November election when um, Proposition 64 was passed. Um, at that meeting, they directed staff to put together a community forum that was held in February. Um, that forum was not attended like this. I think there were 30 to 35 people in attendance. And the general response at that forum was very positive towards licensing commercial cannabis in, in Half Moon Bay. There were subsequent meetings that the city council held, um, including their retreat, where they discussed these. The most recent uh, meeting that the city council held and provided direction to staff was August 15th at their city council meeting. And based on that direction, uh, city council asked staff to prepare an ordinance. Um, and here's some of the details of what they, they asked us to include in that draft ordinance. Um, there's two main areas of licensing that they want included in a draft ordinance for their consideration. The first is greenhouse cultivation only and ancillary uses. And those would include things like storage of the products grown, testing of the products as, as Heather just described, and wholesale distribution. The second uh, license area, there are multiple licenses within that cultivation and ancillary uses licensing, but that's a general area that kind of goes together. The second area is ancillary retail. Um, and that would be of both medicinal and adult use cannabis and allowed deliveries. So the future ordinance that we're putting together right now uh, as staff based on city council direction um, includes some, some details including, first and foremost, the cultivation would only happen on existing greenhouse sites. We have a zoning area called A1. It's where our current commercial greenhouses exist. That's where this would be limited to. Uh, there would be operational standards associated with being able to operate these uh, greenhouses, those operational standards would address some of the concerns that we might discuss tonight. Things like impacts to the community, noise, light pollution, uh, odors, uh, traffic, those types of things. Um, Heather talked about the buffers uh, as one of the uh, requirements that the state has. City counts, those are 600 feet and that's from sensitive areas. So those sensitive areas include schools, daycare, licensed daycare centers, commercial daycare centers, and youth serving facilities. And the direction from the city council was to draft an ordinance that actually extended those buffers to 1,000 feet, um, although they want to see the impacts to the A1 zones based on that additional buffer zone. We also are including facility setbacks from residential properties, minimum distances from the actual cannabis facilities, from residential properties. And this cultivation portion of the ordinance would include these ancillary uses, the, the regulation of storage, testing, and distribution on these A1 sites. The second area that is really important is ancillary retail. And they do want us to include medicinal and or adult use um, retail on these sites. These facilities be, would be limited to 1,000 square feet per uh, premise. And we'll define that for you in a moment because it's, it's a little confusing how this breaks down, so we'll define that. But it's a limit of 1,000 square feet of retail per premise. Uh, any ancillary retail would have to be on the same premise as the agricultural use, the cultivation, which means you can't just have a a retail location somewhere. It has to be part of that operation on, on the same site. And it has to be subservient to cultivation. It has to be the sale of only cannabis grown on that site 
there'd be no edibles, there'd be no extractions or any manufactured goods, and no paraphernalia for using cannabis. Uh, the other important regulation, I think, would be no on-site consumption. We know that that's a concern from the community and that would not be allowed at these sites. There'd also be limited signage for these sites and limited hours of operation specifically for retail. So on your tables, uh, we've provided some maps that show these sensitive locations that are uh, expressed in the state codes. And the red, so those are the yellow um, parcels that you see. Uh, at the top, you can see the parcel that is Half and Bay High School. Uh, towards the beach, there's Los Niños, which is a commercial daycare facility. Downtown, you can see the Ted Adcock Center as it is a youth serving facility. Uh, Cunha Middle School, the library, uh, Seacrest School, and then going south, we have the Holy Family Children's Center and the Coastside Child Development Center. The red circles that surround these represent the 600-foot buffer zone that is the default that the state has put in place. The blue lines represent the 1,000-foot buffers that the city is considering to include in the draft ordinance. And if you look closely, I know it's hard to see, but um, there are sites that are outlined in black with green lines. Those are our current A1 zone sites with greenhouse operations on them. So as you can see, for the most part, and, and on your maps, it's a greater area. It, it incorporates Miramar. It shows rocket farms. Um, as you go south, it'll show Bay City Flowers. Uh, just for the purposes of what I'm showing here, this is where it's concentrated to, the, the buffer zones. But some of these sites would be impacted by going to the 1,000 feet. So the city council is going to be considering those impacts as it weighs that decision. One of the clarifications we have in our draft ordinances that we're putting together is the difference between a greenhouse and a hoop house. A greenhouse is what the city council has allowed as a, a site that could be used for this purpose. A greenhouse is a physical structure, it's been permitted, it's, it's got hard walls and glass, it's, you know, transparent glass. Hoop houses are different. They are temporary structures that really improve outdoor growing, but they're still considered outdoor growing. And we're, we're continuing to define that, um, but the hoop houses are not what we are qualifying as an existing greenhouse that could be converted to this type of use. So going back to the license types, I want to define a few things for you so that you understand how these operations could look. The first, the large area on the outside, the dashed line, that's a premises, that's a site. It's a particular piece of property owned by somebody that is zoned A1 that could be used for these purposes. An individual premise could be made up of multiple parcels. Some, par you know, some sites have large parcels, maybe a single parcel. Others have multiple parcels. When we're looking at this, multiple parcels can still make up a single premise. And the single premise is important as we talk about the different functions. On a single premise, there could be one or multiple greenhouses. And each of those greenhouses can be licensed for commercial cannabis cultivation. And those licenses could be issued on an entire greenhouse, portions of greenhouses, Current state laws really limit the size of each of these licenses, but state law does not limit the number of licenses that can be obtained by a single operator. So one operator can have multiple licenses to expand their footprint within a greenhouse. In addition, there are ancillary uses that go along with uh, greenhouse cultivation, including a storage facility, which would not be a greenhouse. It would be a different type of building. There would also be likely a distribution facility where vehicles would come in and, and take the products to the wholesale sales. As part of that also, there could be incorporated into those buildings or in a standalone building, a testing lab. Last but not least at the bottom is the retail facilities. And the reason we've defined a premise as we have is each premise, each site is where you'll be allowed the single retail facility of 1,000 square feet. This is all important because as the city uh, considers issuing licenses, the state allows for multiple operators on a single site. That site might be owned by a local property owner or farmer who has no intention of actually cultivating cannabis themselves or being involved in the cannabis industry. 
but they would be allowed to lease out their premises to other operators, so the city would issue licenses to the operators, not necessarily to the property owners. And we'll explain a little bit as to why that's the methodology that we're, we're taking. Uh, a single operator could have all areas of cannabis business. They could have greenhouses where they're cultivating cannabis. They could have storage facilities for what they are cultivating on the site, distribution and testing facilities, and a retail store to sell just what's sold on the site. If this site had multiple operators that were cultivating and distributing cannabis, there would still only be a single retail site. So one operator permit license to grow cannabis does not equal one retail store. Each site is limited to a single retail store. Anything else we should go on that? So we want to talk a little bit about the licensing process. So the, the first thing we have to understand is there's two distinct things that will have to happen. For any development that would happen on these properties, they would have to, a, a property, an operator or property owner would have to receive a coastal development permit because we are in the coastal zone. Development could be replacement of an existing greenhouse, intensification of use, increased water usage or electricity usage or other factors that could trigger that type of review, or a new structure such as the retail store or uh, the different distribution and storage facilities. So that is a part of the process that has to take place if any of those factors trigger that um, land use development permit. The other area is the actual commercial license to operate one of these businesses. And the way that we're setting it up, each of those licenses would be subject to discretionary review. There are administrative permits that if you meet a certain criteria, city staff can sign you off and you can operate. We're not going through a, a, an administrative process, it's a discretionary process. Every single license that could be issued by the city would first go to the city council for a public meeting where we could discuss the, the operating plan for these businesses and the impacts specific to that operation to the community. Both the land use and the commercial license are both subject to environmental review under CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. <laughs> um, so I think the point we want to make is if the city council decides to go forward with this ordinance, that's not the end of the process. Each operator, as they apply for a license, is going to go through one or more discretionary reviews, which will include the city council and potentially an environmental review. So we want to talk a little bit about fees and taxes. Um, if a person applies for a license, there will be a city licensing fee, and the purpose of that fee is not to generate revenue to the city. It's simply to cover the regulatory costs of processing licenses and licensing cannabis businesses. There will potentially be sales tax revenue if retail operations are allowed in the city of Half Moon Bay, and that'll just be based on our existing sales taxes. Revenue from cult cultivation operations will happen if voters approve a tax, and we're looking at June or November of next year to come forward with a tax. Anything else we want to add? So I think at this point, we have an opportunity to allow some clarifying questions based on the presentation we've given. Um, if, if there's a question that's outside of the presentation we've given, we'd ask you to make a note of it on a note card and we can respond to it separately. Thank you, Matthew. Do you want to take the mic to them or I'll take a mic? Okay, that'll be great. Okay. So just clarifying questions at this time. Okay, that's fine. Hello, a uh, question from Matt on the sales tax issue and revenue to the city. Uh, sales tax, 6% goes to the state general fund, 1% goes to the county general fund. So, and only a small portion of that trickles down to us. So even if retail sales were taxed at you know, our current eight and a half or whatever percent, it, we can't be thinking that that eight and a half percent comes to us. It's a minuscule portion of that 8% sales tax, unless the city levies an additional tax on it, or if again, half of the bay goes for like a half cent um, sales tax overlay as they did in the past. 
That, that's absolutely correct. Um, any sales tax collected on retail operations will be distributed to the city in the same way that all of our sales taxes are distributed. So it is only a small portion of the overall sales tax that's collected. Thank you. Can you clarify the um, potential locations for testing labs? Are they, as the um, regulations currently being drafted, only going to be allowable in A1 zoned locations? Yes, and, and I'll clarify even beyond that. Any of the business licenses for cannabis that we've just talked about tonight will only be allowed on an A1 commercial site and only if cultivation is the primary function on that site. So a lab would only be allowed on that site as a, an ancillary function of cultivation on that site. To follow up on that, um, does current A1 zoning allow for retail operations within that zoning area? Thank you, that's a, that's a good question. And, and we should have pointed out earlier, the functions that we're talking about are already all allowed on A1 zoning sites and most of these operations are happening for other floriculture businesses. So thank you for that question. Clarifying question regarding the passage of the ordinance and the CEQA review for the ordinance. I mean, how involved will that be? Will it really take into account all the cumulative impacts from these new types of uses, which could put additional demands on water, energy, traffic, et cetera? So I'd like to hear about that. Thank you. Yeah, so the SB 94 included a CEQA exemption for ordinances that set up local licensing processes for commercial cannabis, provided that the license that is being um, set up is a discretionary license that itself would be subject to CEQA. And so CEQA would happen when we receive applications for the distinct businesses to come forward and, and not for this ordinance. What is CEQA? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I sometimes guilt. That's the California Environmental Quality Act that requires review of environmental impacts of proposed projects. Hi, my question, my clarifying question is, I'm hearing a lot of talk in present and future tense. Is this a definite happening situation that we're gonna have this ordinance or is it still up for debate? And um, along the same tack, are you basing this on the 30 or so people that came to the previous meetings without taking into account what people here might think? Thank you, that's an important question we should have addressed as part of our presentation. Uh, it is not a done deal. What the city council has directed staff to do based on the feedback they had gotten so far was to draft these ordinances to include a lot of the concerns that we could anticipate and had already heard from citizens. And any ordinance would have to go to a public hearing and at that public hearing, city council would um, hear those concerns and be able to consider it. And another thing I wanted to clarify, the original timeline for all of this had us bringing that draft ordinance on October or September 19th next Tuesday for city council consideration. Um, after consulting with the city council, we are not going to be bringing the draft ordinance on Tuesday. They have decided that they really want a lot more public feedback based on what we've been hearing recently. And I think this meeting is a perfect example of how much more feedback there is to gain. So we will still address this issue at the city council meeting next Tuesday night and all are invited to come. It will be a scheduled item, which means there will be an opportunity to talk about your thoughts on this directly with the city council. But no, they have not made a decision on whether or not they'll adopt this ordinance. We, we have to draft an ordinance for them to consider. Thank you. Thank you. When I drive north toward El Granada, I see lots of um, empty greenhouses on the right-hand side. If I go south of town, I see lots of greenhouses there. Am I right in assuming that all of that is zone day one and therefore is up for grabs? So I think an important clarification, thank you for that question, is as many of us know, um, the coast side is one community, but the city of Half Moon Bay only has jurisdiction over what's within the city limits. The county of San Mateo has jurisdiction over anything south of Half Moon Bay, you know, down through Pescadero and all the way down to the Santa Cruz County line, and properties north of um, the Miramar area. Um, the county is also contemplating similar ordinances. There are some key differences in, in their considerations right now, and their process is going to be different than ours. 
Um, but we do consult with the county and um, we're, we're hoping that there will be some enough similarities between the ordinances that we won't see a great disparity between what's happening in the un unincorporated area versus what's happening in the city. That being said, within the city of Half Moon Bay, our commercial greenhouses are zoned A1 and are potentially, if an ordinance were to pass, would be available for cannabis cultivation, yes. What, and actually, what, uh, let me go back to the map because I think that will help you to see. And, and you're not gonna be able to see it here. You'll look at your table on the maps on the table. The yellow outline, those are the city limits. So it's only the properties within those city limits that would be subject to the ordinance that we're talking about here. If you have concerns about the greenhouses outside of that yellow area, those are under the jurisdiction of the county. And like I said, they're going through a similar process right now. And you might want to reach out to the county. Right. The, the map I put here, I, I cut it off because I wanted to be able to really focus in on those buffer zones. And that's why you've got to refer to the maps on your table if you want to see the city limits. We can make these maps available on our website and other means so that people can really get a good look at it. And if you've included your email address um, at the beginning of the meeting and just make a mention, we can email you a copy of that map. What provisions is the city going to put in place to enforce these provisions in light of the fact that in the states of Colorado and Washington, the, um, which had of course legalized you know, pot cultivation num a number of years ago, there has been an exponential increase in black market operations in terms of cultivation sites in private homes, which has strained law enforcement past the point where it can even start enforcing it and brought in drug cartels into Colorado. So I, we wanna make sure we understand that was a, a, a very good and long question. So you're asking how the city intends to enforce any ordinance that could be adopted, yes. but it, it, it goes beyond just enforcing licensed operators, but unlicensed Licensed. operators that, that clearly already exist here on the coast side. Um, I think that question might require some follow-up from our sheriff's office who provide the law enforcement up and down the coast and has had to deal with many of these illegal grows that you're talking about. From an enforcement of licensed operator standpoint, um, I think there's several areas that we're addressing here, um, and I'll let Heather cover some of those as well, but a part of it is a license isn't for life. There will have to be a renewal each year, and part of that renewal will, will likely involve an inspection of the property. There will be periodic inspections of the property, um, things of that nature to make sure that what has been agreed to and authorized is actually what's happening on those sites. And we have a limited number of sites here. We believe that it's something that can be enforced. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there projections for expected revenue for Half Moon Bay from passing these ordinances? So uh, going back to the fees and taxes question, currently the only revenues that the city could receive our sales tax revenues if retail were to be licensed here in the city. And as has been pointed out, it's not the entire sales tax that comes to the city, but only a small portion. Uh, yeah, about 1%. Until a voter approved tax of the cultivation itself or a supplemental sales tax or something of that nature occurs, there won't be any other revenues to the city. There will be fees to help offset our costs so that at least taxpayers aren't paying the regulatory costs related. But as far as revenues that could be utilized for city programs and doing improvements to the community, that would not happen until uh, a, a tax has passed. And, and so because of that, there have not been estimates. We don't know yet how many licenses could be issued, how many people would be interested in licenses. That would all, of course, be part of uh, any sort of analysis that would go towards um, a tax. Matthew, I want to make sure that we stay on time and that we honor um, the time. It's 725, which is actually the time that we should be breaking out into our small groups. I know that um, 
we have other clarifying questions, but we want to make sure that it's clarifying questions to the presentation that took place. Remember, if you have other questions, please put them down on the cards that should be on the tables. Did we have enough to put out? Okay, make sure that you put those um, questions on those cards. Every question is important and will be addressed. So we have one more question here and one here, and then we're gonna move into our small groups. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, could you please explain what steps and provisions will be there for the protection of children? Uh, two thirds of the district's enrollment will be directly impacted by this um, or potential ordinance, and particularly because it's now a greenhouse rather than in some ways it would be better if it was a retail, because as, as alcohol is handled, I mean, so we have the precedent, parents know where these places are and they know how to protect their kids. Now you have a greenhouse operation with a, maybe a little retail on the side kind of thing going here. And how, how will that, how will the, the ordinance deal with uh, appropriate protections to the property so the kids aren't on there? I'll answer that. There's already a lot of requirements in state law that um, minors can't go on to retail sites. They're not allowed in the facility. Um, there's requirements to state to check uh, ID cards, just as in bars, that you, they're not going to be able to sell to minors without, or you know, to sell to anyone without an identify identification check. Uh, we're also requ requiring um, security to be on site. There's no um, loitering allowed on a commercial cannabis pre premise, so that these won't be places where people will just be gathering. Um, and then there's the additional protections um, about uh, no advertising to minors, no advertising near schools, um, the sort of uh, child protection of the, of the product, products itself. And, and I think the buffer zones also play a part in that, and, and that was what was contemplated by the state, is we keep all commercial operations away from facilities that generally serve youth. One more question, and then we're gonna move into our small groups. First off, thank you uh, for putting this opportunity together. I think you can see a lot of people are interested in it. My, my main question is you, you mentioned in, uh, regulations being put in place around traffic and odor and light pollution. Um, has the city considered how they're gonna pay for this? Just as, um, to clarify. Uh, uh, how, who is gonna pay for how, what? How is the city going to enforce these regulations that you say you're gonna be putting in place? And that's the purpose of the regulatory licensing fee, is we'll actually go through a process where we'll calculate our costs for um, regulating, processing licenses, doing the inspections. Uh, portions of this fee might be a direct cost to the operator. Um, so. The, the purpose of the regulatory fee is to offset those costs so that it doesn't come out of the general fund. And I'll just okay. say that I'll be available throughout the meeting and afterwards if people have additional questions. Okay. I'm sorry, but I do, and I've been raising my hand to ask. Okay. And it is important to me that the city does Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'll hold it I'm not a pushy person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is a very pushy issue, and we must consider the 1,000-foot buffer. 600 feet, two football fields from a shop, and no matter what we say about age or who allows what, we know that these are not put in stone because kids and their parents don't follow them. That's all. Thank you. I'm sorry if it's... Did, did you have a question? Well, that is my question. So what are we going to do to make sure that our children are safe? Because what I'm hearing is that it's more important to get the growers and the stench and the water usage and all of this than it is to protect our children. So what are we doing for our children? Okay, so that'll be the last question. Just, again, to further respond to that, um, I, we, we've got the buffer. There are stringent security requirements that'll be part of the licensing process. 
The sheriff's office will be involved in not only reviewing any sort of security plan on the property, this, the sheriff's office is consulting us as we develop the, license, the ordinances as well. So it is something that's being considered and there are items being put into the ordinances to help resolve that. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move into our small groups. I do want to remind everyone in the building, um, earlier we talked about group agreements. So just in case those who were late coming in, here are your group agreements lined up here on the wall. Please be reminded to be respectful when you're speaking. We're gonna ask that our facilitators come out to the floor now and that we're gonna to try to reorganize you. So we're gonna ask that certain tables, and I'm gonna come around. Uh, while I'm coming around, can we get some kind of uh, small group uh, breakout music for uh, while, while we're readjusting, is that okay? Oh, they don't have music? Oh, okay, that's it? <laughs> Not a DJ, sorry. <laughs> okay. Everyone, everyone, if you could listen, please. Can you turn my mic up? Right here, these two tables are going to be groups, okay? If you can, whoever's going to facilitate, they can facilitate this group. I think Folks, that's facing uh, can I, can this direction. Can I make direction. a comment? Folks, on, if, everyone, we, if we can't hear the instructions, we can't move forward, which means there's less opportunity for you to give your input. So if everybody can just give us a few minutes to get some instruction and get organized, that's what will guarantee an opportunity to provide input that can get to the city council. So I, I, I know that there's a lot to talk about and we'll be available afterwards to talk about it. Okay. But I think right now we've got to listen to our facilitator, get organized so we can get the feedback documented. Right. Thank you. So we're going to ask that each facilitator has two tables. So if I can have a facilitator come on, on this end here, right over here, and bring your easel and your pad with you. These two tables are going to be with this facilitator here, so make sure that you're facing this, um, this easel right here. These two tables, this easel. Okay. Okay, these two tables, uh-huh, should be with this gentleman right here. All right. Returning to a full group, we're ready to hear about next, next steps. We're ready to hear about next steps. Okay, folks, I know that you're having great conversations and we hate to stifle those conversations, but we want to respect the schedule that we're on. Oh, okay, okay. So I'll start off by saying you don't need to end these conversations, just take a quick break. We'll stay here and allow conversations to continue. I'll stay here to answer questions. We'll have some other city staff here to answer questions. But we do want to wrap up, give you a little more information, and, uh, and then we can close the meeting. And again, conversations can continue if you want. So as far as next step goes, um, I, I get the feeling that we have gathered a lot of really great input tonight. I also get the feeling that there's a lot more that needs to be gathered. I think we probably just kind of got the tip of the iceberg tonight. I think there's a lot of folks here who 
up until this week or even tonight hadn't really been engaged in this issue, maybe didn't realize how quickly things were moving and, and that you know, the ordinance was being prepared and being considered. And so we're hoping that you can share with others the experience you had tonight and invite others to engage. So a couple ways that you can engage with the city council. City council is gonna make the policy decisions on how this moves forward. Staff is here to implement those policies and try to do it in a way that's best for this town. But at the end of the day, you really need to let the city council know how you feel. There will be a city council meeting again this coming Tuesday night. There will not be a draft ordinance being considered at that council meeting. They will not take action on this issue. What they will do is they'll get a report out on what we, ha what we heard tonight, how tonight went, the comments provided. They'll also receive all the comments we've been receiving via email and phone calls and other means over the last couple of weeks, which has really accelerated. There will be an opportunity for public input. The podium will be there. You will only have three minutes to address the city council, so you wanna make sure that what you have to share is succinct and to the point and valuable. Um, but that is another opportunity to give your input. Other things that you can do, we will collect all the question cards and we'll make an effort to respond to those as quickly as possible. All the feedback that's been given us tonight will be compiled and a couple of things can happen. We can email. I think we'll just assume that if you wrote your email down on the registration paper when you came in, that you're interested in more information. We'll email the, the, that information out to you when it's compiled. We'll give you updates as far as future public meetings and future opportunities for public input. Additionally, up on the screen is my email address. If you have any other input, any other questions, please send them to me. I may not be the person to respond. It may not be something I can respond to, but send it to me and I will make sure it gets to the right people, whether it's to the city council, whether it's a question to discuss with the city attorney. Um, I will make sure it gets to the right place. This is a very high priority for city staff. It's a very high priority for me and my role. And we'll make sure that these are addressed and that this feedback gets to the city council, no matter what it is that you wanna share. Um, I, I suspect there will be more opportunities to come to public meetings to provide your feedback. And again, at, at, at such point that we bring an ordinance to the city council for consideration, even at that meeting, there will be an opportunity for public feedback and a public hearing to talk about your thoughts and concerns. And we hope to have a draft ordinance where you can actually see what the actual ordinance looks like as opposed to some of the high level summaries that we're giving you now so that you can respond in specific detail. I think at this point, uh, we'll turn it over to PCRC to do a little bit of wrap up. Our staff is putting up all the comments that they've received tonight from your small group discussions. Please feel free afterwards to walk around, see what other people think. Um, there are people in this room that have different opinions than you. Some might sway you a per certain direction or another or cause you to think about something a little differently. And so I encourage you to look at those. And as I said, some city staff will remain here to answer questions and talk about the next steps. So Matt, um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to mention that the slides. Yeah, we will. Um, Post, uh, we're going to be doing something on our website and we can send an email out notifying you where we can provide the feedback from this meeting, uh, other information that's necessary, the question cards, uh, the slideshow that's here, links to other pertinent information. Um, so we will get that up and running and we'll, we'll get that information to you soon. Another thing I wanted to point out, again, um, we're really grateful Pacific Coast Television came tonight to broadcast this event live so that it, there's, for those that couldn't come, and we got a lot of emails from people that had feedback but couldn't come, hopefully they were able to watch. It was broadcast live on, the T, on channel 27 on Comcast. It was broadcast live, uh, streamed live on pacificcoast.tv. And if you go to pacificcoast.tv um, and go to archived programs, you'll be able to watch this back if, if that so interests you. Uh, but I just, I wanna thank them. Oh, right, thank you for pointing that out. They didn't film the small group portion. That was an opportunity to you for, for you to talk amongst your groups. It, obviously very chaotic and, and it was a chance for you to speak freely. So that won't be broadcast. It wasn't even filmed. 
Okay, we want to say thank you to everyone. You were fantastic. I want you to give yourselves a round of applause. Please give the facilitators a round of applause. You can wipe those brows, all right? And now, oh, we're actually going to be leaving just a little bit early. But before we go, we want to make sure that... Uh, we want to make sure that you fill out the evaluations that are on the table. Please take out just a couple of seconds to fill those out. There's also food here. We want to make sure that you refresh yourself, replenish yourself from all the hard work that you put in on tonight. And if I'm not mistaken, that's it, right? Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.